about 10 years ago, I, I joined this uh, foundation uh, and this foundation deals with science education. So the objectives of Fondation La Malapat, which is patronized by the Academy of Science and the Ecole Normale Supérieure of Paris and Lyon. Uh, the objective is to train teachers, to help teachers, to provide resources to teachers for teaching science in primary and the secondary school and also kindergarten. So uh, up to that moment when I arrived, the, the main principles that were adopted at La Malapat involved how to make students active in their learning of science uh, in the class, but uh, we were lacking a view on uh, what it means for, for students to be active in a more general sense, not just using their hands, and what science and cognitive science in particular, the cognitive science of learning, of memory, of attention, of, uh, um, of metacognition can bring in to enhance our capacity of teaching science. Why do certain students, or all the students actually resist certain ideas such as evolution? Uh, why certain concepts in science are so difficult to acquire or to stabilize? And we go back to our previous conceptions. So one of my main objectives when I arrived at La Malapat was to uh, infuse this knowledge, to, to, to gather this knowledge, to, to unify this knowledge what do we know about how we learn that can be le relevant for helping teachers and for helping students uh, to better learn science, to uh, avoid certain obstacles and uh, to deal with their, with their learning. Uh, for that reason, a few years ago, I would say three years ago, but I might be wrong. Uh, we created a portal, which is called Synapse, which you see here. And the objective of this portal is doing exactly what I was saying that I do at La Malapath, that is to gather this knowledge that we have and to provide this knowledge directly to teachers, that is to do mediation, um, but in a way that can be immediately used by teachers. That is, we don't just write articles about how the brain works, we try to understand working with teachers, what are their main needs. We go from, from the class, from the needs of the students and the, and the teachers to search in the literature, search in the evidence, which is broader than uh, literature in cognitive science, the evidence about what works in education and try to identify strategies or knowledge that can be useful to teachers. For instance, knowledge about attention and the limits of attention, how we should take them into account when uh, structuring a class, when structuring a lecture, or when putting students to work on a certain scientific topic. And this portal really wants to be uh, a double way portal, the, the, a double road between teachers and researchers and researchers and teachers. And with this kind of, of portal, we try to do another thing, which is uh, crucial for me today in the domain of uh, joining uh, cognitive science with education, that is providing teachers with validated knowledge, with solid knowledge, uh, filtering all the stuff that they can read in different papers and newspapers around or here, just in the corridors, and also, uh, teaching teachers, educating teachers to have a critical thinking approach to what they hear and what they read uh, about the brain. We are bombarded by news about new discoveries, but most of the time, these new discoveries are results that are partial, that are temporary, that will be updated in two years, 10 years, five years. So one of the jobs that we have is to, uh, is to educate teachers to recognize how to recognize uh, good evidence, evidence that is stable, that they can use immediately, and also to recognize it from, filter it from uh, fake or really um, methods that really don't work but are branded brain uh, based methods, but also to recognize it from knowledge that is uh, just at the fruit of recent research, then they cannot really rely on it because it is some, something that uh, uh, concerns, that is important for the researchers, but not necessarily immediately today for the applications. So this work 
of reflection of what it means to translate knowledge from a domain of research into practice and to favor as much as we can a new venue uh, of research in the domain of education, uh, which we call uh, evidence-based education and translational research in education, drawing energies from cognitive science among other uh, domains of research that can help education. And for this reason, and this is outside my activity at La Main à la Patte, I participate uh, to the National Council of uh, uh, Scientists uh, helping uh, and accompany the Ministry of Education, Conseil Scientifique de l'Education Nationale, where we try to do uh, a little bit the same things I do at La Malapat, uh, but beyond the domain of sciences, that is bridging the gap between research and also between research in cognitive science and education and favoring the creation of new forms of research, which are translational, which start from the fundamental research in cognitive science on certain principles of how we learn or how we think, how we reason, all through the way towards application in the classroom. And for that, a uh, very important thing, of course, it's new, probably unuseful to stress it with you, is to test uh, the ideas that come from fundamental research into the classroom. But the other important part is to come from the classroom with questions and with practical knowledge that teachers do have and questions that are relevant for their job in order to, uh, um, in order to uh, solicitate research in the domain of cognitive science, including fundamental cognitive science, that, it, that can be useful. And as a final uh, example of these activities, I would like you to show, I'd like to show you uh, one of the most recent projects that we have created at La Malapat, but which has a counterpart in the Scientific Council of the, uh, uh, of the Ministry of Education, uh, which is a project about critical thinking. There's a, a huge lack of knowledge about critical thinking and everybody is talking about critical thinking, the importance of critical thinking and why we should teach critical thinking. But actually we don't exactly know what we are talking about when we talk about educating critical thinking. And many people say many different things, including op opposite things. So one of the jobs of people working between cognitive science, philosophy of cognitive science and education is to gather the knowledge, what do we know about the basis, the natural basis, the cognitive building blocks of critical thinking? Do we have, can we give a proper definition of critical thinking, restricted and based, and uh, uh, which can be connected with what we know about the functioning of the mind and brain? And what do we know that it is relevant? And if we don't know enough, which are the new research that we should need in order to better understand critical thinking. And from that, can we develop activities for the classroom that uh, have some hope of developing critical thinking because they are based on what we know today about the functioning of the brain and mind, and can we test them? And this is exactly what we've done a la main la patte. We have participated to a project of the INR, of the Agence Nationale de la Recherche, uh, we have produced a huge report on what we know about critical thinking, provided a definition which is solid from the point of view of philosophy and from the point of view of science, gather the knowledge we have about epistemic vigilance, about metacognition, about confidence, about trust, and on this basis, proposed interventions for educating critical thinking and tested them in the class. I don't have the results yet. I am very sorry. I hope to have them soon, but the COVID has created some issues in our reactivity. So this is one example of how someone interested in cognitive science with a background in cognitive science can put this knowledge into action, both producing new knowledge and producing uh, practical activities and let's say forcing or at least inviting people from the domain of education and people from the domain of research to work together. And today at the Conseil Scientifique de l'Education Nationale, we have a working group dedicated to educating critical thinking. So we are trying to reach beyond the immediate activity, beyond research, also uh, the decision makers who can help us and all the different chains 
of reaction and action in the domain of education, those who do the evaluations, those who train teachers, those who train initial uh, 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 teachers who are not yet teachers, who form new teachers, how can we influence their actions through the knowledge that we have gathered? So this is all what I wanted to share in this first, uh, first chat. And uh, of course, you can ask all the questions you want. OK, thank you, Elena, for this very interesting and rich presentation. So as I said uh, um, at the beginning of the session, I think that we'll, we'll take questions uh, for Elena uh, at the end of the session after the three speakers um, uh, have intervened. So um, our second speaker is uh, Adeline André. So um, Adeline is a NIA IPR, Academic Inspector of the Academy of Versailles. Uh, after a, biology, a PhD in biology, she became a SVT, so biology teacher, I guess, in junior high and high school. She then uh, joined the Lama Lapa team, and she has many uh, years of experience uh, conducting the academic and national experiments of the learning labs, which use the, the contribution of cognitive science to promote learning in all disciplines. So, Aline, um, I believe. Okay, can you hear me? That's, yes. Yes, okay. Uh, so hello everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be uh, with you this morning, contributing to the links between uh, cognitive science and education. So my name is uh, Adeline André. I'm an inspectrice de l'éducation nationale uh, for secondary schools uh, dans l'Académie de Versailles. And I started uh, this job four years ago. And since then, I've had two main missions. So the first one is to drive biology and earth science teaching. But the second one is to reinforce the use of cognitive sciences in secondary schools. So the question is how we go from principle to actions in learning environments. The objective of what I do is to promote evidence-based education, uh, to use cognitive science main results to change pedagogical practices in classrooms, and to implement tools and strategies for effective teaching and effective learning in classroom. So that's why we need cognitive science results, and that's why we need you. Uh, the main topics on which we work are memorization, consolidation related to the testing effect, to the importance of interleaving or space practice, comprehension, attention, active engagement, error feedback, executive functions, metacognition, regulation of disruptive behaviors. And I'm going to try to show you how we do so. Uh, but just um, first, I'd like to present you the result of an experiment that was conducted in science and history classes in France with 1,300 pupils. So during the first part of the year, teacher taught as they usually do. And during the second part of the year, um, they use some specific tools and strategies to support memorization and comprehension. And in uh, January and June, pu pupils' knowledge were assessed. So here you have got some information about the experiments, but I'm not going to go further. So here are the main results. So in January, the main final score was 43%. And in June, it was 61%. And in this graph, um, the results are divided according to the score values in January. So you can compare scores between June and January. And we can see two things. The first one is that those tools benefit to every pupil's expect for the very, very good ones. And the second thing is that the more pupils are in difficulty, the greater the benefit. That is shown by the red line. So these are those who are less able to self-activate appropriate cognitive functions. 
and other results, we have to construct tools and strategies that force the right cognitive function to be activated at the right moment. And because it's very often not intuitive for those pupils, we have to train pupils to make them understand why it is so. And it's very important if you want if we want pupils to be confident with uh, what we propose. So I'm going to show you a few examples of tools and strategy. The first one is, um, est-ce que vous voyez le, le cadre orange qui est sur les diapos ou pas? Oui, effectivement, il y a, ouais. il y a un... Alors, c'est un peu... Je ne sais pas peux... comment l'enlever. Est-ce que tu peux déplacer le cadre? Non, tu ne peux, tu peux rien faire dessus. Mais non, j'y arrive pas. Euh... Ceci dit, là, on ne le voit plus, non euh, Il okay. apparaît en transparence. Bon, bon ouais, je te propose de continuer euh, avec le cadre. Ouais, ouais, OK. Uh, so the first example is what we call in French uh, la fiche mémo. Uh, so the principle is very simple. Here, at the, at the middle, you have questions that correspond to the main notions of a lesson. And you've got uh, the expected answers. And there is, at the beginning, a tracking table where the pupil indicates whether or not he or she answered correctly, indicate that uh, questions should be asked several times. And the further to the right you go, the further no, the number of nights between uh, questions. And when revising, a pupil can start with the less master questions. So you see that this tool is quite simple, but if you want to use it properly, you have to be trained about that. And this tool use testing effects, face practice. It gives information about about mistakes, it contributes to metacognition and regulation for a better learning. And on this picture, you can see two pupils that are using a fish memo to review a French lesson. So they ask questions to each other and they use the expected answer to correct themselves. So here is another example. It, we call it a space practice calendar and it starts to be built by teachers. It helps them plan learning in black and revision in great time. So it's very efficient. Another one, uh, we call it the Projet Progrès. So in English, it could be the Progress Project. So at the top, you have um, um, explanation about what is expected by the teacher and what kind of production uh, pupils can make. So after work, pupils self-evaluate themselves. So you can see the little numbers. And each time they can formulate ways to improve their work for next time. The advantage is that for one skill, you have all the advice in one place. So it is a metacognitive and regulatory tool that guide progress and make them very visible and it is very efficient. Um, we try to make our work available for all the teachers. So for example, last year during the lockdown, we produced this uh, generally. You have the link if you're interested. We wanted to help teachers in their choice for efficient cognitive solutions uh, to help pupils learn why schools were closed. So for each category, memoriser, comprendre, planifier, etc. Um, we presented pedagogical ways to improve learning, real tools, testimonies from teachers that are trying to do so, and resources to learn more about that. Um, if we want our approach based on cognitive science to be real and effective for pupils, we need to train teachers. And to do so, we need to have trainers. So our concrete actions in uh, l'Académie de Versailles um, are to produce resources and to organize training sessions for trainers 
for teachers, school teams, and uh, for pupils. And there is another one action which is called the Learning Lab Network, and I'm going to talk about that now. So in a previous life, I was full-time at La Main à la Patte, and I was very happy to work with the Lada. And um, what I learned there is uh, the importance of making people work together in network with shared values. So three years ago, I created a network of secondary schools that are using cognitive science main results about learning. At the beginning, there were three schools and now it's around 30 of them. We do share a common charter. So you can see it there, it's quite short, uh, where we explain who we are and what we do. When you enter this network, you do develop a project, but with all the members of the community. So that means pupils, teachers, parents, headmaster, partners, etc. In each learning lab, we do have a room or at least a piece of wall where you can find the logo, and the logo is the one you can see at the left top of the slide. And on the walls, we do have uh, also posters about learning. So here you can see two posters that we made about uh, learning or how brain works. Or we have posters that with only punchline with a very strong message. Um, in each learning, learning lab, we do have three or two or three um, reference that are trained and linked together, we have a, a virtual space to work together. And we have working access. So each learning lab has to find solutions to make pupils understand how the brain works, has to choose tools and strategy to improve effective teaching and learning. They have to decide when and where to support learning. They have to find solutions for how how to train um, the rest of the staff, how to involve parents, how to find other person that can help. If they want to equip the learning lab with books or tools, and if they want to think about how arranging spaces and furniture to support better learning. So that is what we work about. So I know that what we do is not perfect, and I wish I could have more time to develop those actions, but I'm convinced that we need teachers and cognitive sciences specialists to work together to have a better understanding of how we learn, how we make every pupil more successful. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Adeline, for this very uh, convincing presentation. Um, so our third speaker now is uh, Lea Combet. Uh, so Lea is a PhD student at Paris Brain Institute and Energy Jeune Association. Her project focuses on why and how psychosocial interventions could be a reliable solution to fight against uh, underachievement in underprivileged areas. So Lea, it's um, your turn. Okay, can you hear me correctly? Yes. Okay. I will share my screen too. And I will cut off my video because I have a very bad uh, bandwidth. Yeah, like okay, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, as Valerian said before, uh, my name is Lea Combet and I'm a PhD student between the Paris Brain Institute and the Association Energy Gen. Uh, you have my email address at the bottom of the slide, so if you have any question after the meeting, feel free to contact me. Just to have an overview of this short presentation, I will briefly talk about my background and my current project before to spend a little bit more time on two questions, which are, in my opinion, quite important in applied sciences. The first one is, why are cognitive sciences important in my work? And the second one is, why are cognitive sciences not enough? So, in a nutshell, I started with a bachelor in psychology then I wanted to dig deeper into the understanding of cognition, so I decided to study cognitive sciences and I obtained my master's degree three and a half years ago. Then I started to work as a pedagogical coordinator at a scientific 
preparatory school and at the same time I passed a postgraduate diploma in scientific mediation through evening classes. And at this time I started missing a lot the research field so I decided to start as an independent trainer in cognitive sciences applied to education and at the same time I started to contact researchers to develop a PhD project. And I discovered the association Energy Gen, which was looking for a PhD student to help them to improve their intervention. So there I am. I started to work with them two years ago as a scientific officer, and that led me to start my seat for PhD with the Paris Brain Institute one year ago. I also wanted to mention some voluntary work, which has been very instructive for me. Among other, I have been a volunteer at Cognizance Talence and Cogina. And finally, I also created a podcast channel about cognitive science applied to education, which is called Papier Cream. As I said before, my PhD is a collaboration between the Paris Brain Institute and Energigen. Just a few words about Energigen. This association delivers what is called mindset interventions and provides students with tools to achieve scholar goals. And their interventions are based on the scientific literature and they are delivered to middle school students from underprivileged areas. In this association, the main goal of my thesis is to understand how those short interventions could be improved. And I go back uh, and I can't go back, go back on that later if you have questions. But I said that it would be more interesting for you if we focus on one specific project I worked on and which, which is directly related to the two questions I asked earlier. And the first question was, why cognitive sciences are important for an educational association? In my opinion, the first element is that without science, your work could be influenced by biases and neuromies. And if that's the case, you are wasting a lot of money and a lot of time. Let's take an example. In one of our interventions, we ask students to determine a scholar goal they want to achieve until the next session. And to achieve it, a really popular method is positive thinking. I have heard so many times that positive thinking is really efficient to achieve your goals. But if you take a look at the literature, that's not true. Positive thinking could even have a negative impact. Why? Because if you only focus on positive outcomes, you will lose the motivation as soon as you encounter an obstacle. However, a method which is really efficient is to follow four steps. The first one is think about what you want, what is your wish. The second one is thinking about why you want it, what will be the outcome of this wish. The third one is think about the main obstacle you could encounter and finally, you can make a plan to overcome this obstacle. This method is called the WOOP and it has been developed by the researchers Gabriel Ettingen and the results are way more convincing. But to know that, you have to go through the literature. A second element is interdisciplinar interdisciplinarity because with a scientific approach, asking how to improve mindset intervention is also asking many other questions like, which beliefs are important for scholar achievements, how can we change those beliefs, what are the underlying mechanisms, or even how humans make decisions. And you are referring to disciplines like social and cognitive psychology, neuroscientists, or behavioral economy. Of course, no one is a master on all those fields, but knowing how to read a scientific paper could be really helpful if you want to have a scientific approach to your question. So cognitive sciences are important to design efficient educational interventions, but in my opinion, they are not enough. And the explanation is quite simple. As I said before, you really need science to know if your intervention makes sense. But before that, you really have to be sure that your intervention is not answering a question that nobody asked. Because if schools are not interested by your intervention, you just can't use it. And if schools are interested, but students do not pay any attention during your intervention, it will certainly be absolutely useless. And finally, if your intervention is efficient, 
is popular among teachers and students, but let's say is really expensive, it will be quite complicated to deliver it to many students. That's why you really have to take into account all those questions. Now, let's go back on my previous example, the WHOOP. In the literature, the WHOOP is really efficient, even with young students. But when we developed it in France, we realized that, that French middle school students really struggle to understand the link between the four steps. For example, some students can say that the obstacle is chit-chatting during classes, but then their plan was to go earlier to bed, which is totally unrelated to the obstacle. So it's a good example of why science is not enough, because even if this method is really efficient, it can be if your students do not understand it. So we have to think about how to adapt it for French middle school students. And this year, we ended up collaborating with the finalists of the talent show, The Voice, to create a rap video, which is called Motivation, Problem, Solution. If you want to listen to it, you can easily find it on YouTube. And I thought it was a typical example of the fact that science cannot always be used directly out of the lab. Well, I hope this short presentation brought you some element of thought. Once more, you can find my email address at the bottom of the slide, so feel free to contact me if you have questions about my background, the association, or my PhD projects. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lea, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, so we have time for questions now. Um, who wants to start? You can raise your hand if you have questions. Yes, Eli. Um, hi, so yes, uh, Eli, I'm a PhD student with uh, Christian Lorenzi so at the LSP lab, but I'm uh, really new at Cognitive Sciences. And before my beginning of PhD, the only reference I had on uh, Cognitive Sciences was uh, Beatrice Milletre, uh, who worked uh, on uh, the importance of intuition and uh, sequential uh, reasonment for, so, her thesis, for those who don't know her work, was that there were more people who had a sequential way of reasoning than an intuitive one. And so she, she made the assumption that uh, people who had an intuitive intelligence had more struggle with education. And so I was wondering like, if there was, that was something that you would take into account in making more adaptative uh, cognitive methodology uh, for students. So who, who wants to, to answer? <laughs> Elena, Adeline or Lia? Adeline, yes. Um, I don't know uh, the work you're talking about, um, but what is really important for us is to make pupils explain what they have uh, in mind, what we call a um, model mental. Mm -hmm. And then um, bringing to people some information, some experiments, some something in classroom, and then make every pupil uh, take time for the comparison between where they are now after the, the lessons. Uh, comparing to where they were at the beginning, and there is and the, the gap between the two positions that is very important, because that is this gap that is making learning efficient. So um, I don't know if there are very very different intelligence, but the the, the way we do it um, allowed everyone starting from different points and making sure that everybody is going to the same final point. So. Yes, maybe Elie's question is raising another interesting uh, question as to whether uh, education, uh, sorry, evidence-based education tools should you know, speak directly to system one or system two in, in school, uh, in, uh, in uh, students, in 11. Uh, in, in whether we should speak to uh, the LS intuitions or reflexive abilities. I don't know whether it makes sense for you. Um, may I? Yes. 
we have struggled with the system one system two classification in uh, in uh, in the project about critical thinking and it's a way of describing functioning uh, which is simple and intuitive but not always <clears throat> corresponds to what we are looking for and uh, Actually, when when uh, if you want to translate that that in in learning environments, one of the things that you say, for instance, in in teaching critical thinking, is that you you got to provide strategies to overcome certain immediate reactions, which can be wrong in some situations, which are not wrong per se, but which can lead to to wrong decisions or opinions that are unfounded in in certain situations. So you got to provide certain strategies. And this is the reflective approach. You provide strategies, you make uh, students aware about their intuitions and how they work and that they can be right or wrong and that uh, they are totally justified from a point or an evolutionary point of view. So that's not that the, the head is ill-shaped in some, some way or that brain misfunctions it just in certain situations, but ch certain challenges or tasks the intuitive response is not the more adapted, but adapted, not adapted, but it can, can be in other situations. So you provide strategies to understand why you react in this way, as if this is metacognitive knowledge about how you work, why you react in this way, why we all react in this way. You're not the only one, you're not guilty of being stupid. We all react in this way in these situations, most of us, when it is not, when the result is not the outcome that is expected from school, from you, because you want more, you want to be able to analyze a certain kind of information more in depth and not react immediately only to the fact that it is a familiar source which is providing the information, because in that particular case, the familiar source is probably not the most informed one, the, the more reliable one. Then here are the strategies that you can use in order to overcome this kind of immediate reaction, which doesn't mean never that the immediate reaction is something you to feel guilty about or to discard completely or to annihilate or that the, the our uh, immediate responses are, are wrong, but that you need strategies. It is not enough, of course, and uh, we know that uh, this is not just for critical thinking, but for many other forms of learning and mistakes that we make when we learn to read or mathematics, etc. you also need to develop automatic responsive, which are not the same thing as intuitive responsive, but, but that's more the second system one type, that is they become automatic because you just train them a lot and they, they come out uh, at first. So this division, this, this intuitive this division between intuition uh, or let's say system one, system two is taken into account. Uh, we take it into account, of course, when, when we, we deal with, with critical thinking uh, education, of course, but in general in teaching by taking into account the importance of both providing strategies and metacognitively work on how to implement these strategies and why implementing these strategies is difficult, why we resist to that, and in dealing with the automatization of tasks. If you don't automatize certain tasks uh, uh, in reading, you never go to the further step. So this is something that is important in all the theories of learning uh, in, in, in the domain of education. And it is accepted by most, most teachers. I mean, it's something that is part of the culture, if I can say so. Okay, thanks. What is, uh, what is a very efficient in classroom is making a mistakes li list for the common mistakes and also make pupils talk together, explaining together how they, how they think about a, a problems, how they come from a solutions and share their strategy. And it's very more efficient when it's done between pupils than from the teacher. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, don't be shy. Um, <laughs> okay, so maybe uh, I have a very naive and practical question. Uh, maybe it's a question uh, for Adeline. So how much flexibility do teachers have to implement or test so these evidence-based education or teaching tools? Can they do that in their daily practices today? Or do they have to go through specific procedures or, or obtain specific uh, authorizations? Uh, 
No, no, it's very easy. We have what we call um, liberté pédagogique. I don't know. Okay. Freedom in, in pedagogical choice. Freedom. Uh, and uh, so, no, it's very easy to change uh, practical uh, pedagogical practice in classroom because teacher can do whatever he wants or she wants in the class. Um, but we struggle with the very French issue about uh, doing all the um, curricula. It's more that in France we have quite heavy and dense curriculum and teachers are very stressed about that so they really want to be efficient to work a lot and be sure they are going to see all the notions they have to see. And when we come with new pedagogical um, strategies, it's difficult for them because you need time in class to train pupils, to make them understand why you do um, propose that and to make them, to make pupils be confident and uh, with the tools. And it, it, you need time to do that. So sometimes we have troubles with teachers because they say, I would like to do it, but I can't because I don't have enough time. So we have to convince them that because they are going to use those tools, the learning are going to be more efficient and they're going to, to have more time after that to work on whatever they want. Mm. So, okay. But yeah. yes, it's possible. And so it's very important when we, we work with, it's very important to work with teams because when you have several teachers that are involved in the same project, they can support each other. And it's very important for us to go in the school very often so we can be with them, ask to their questions, uh, listen to their problems, very concrete problems, and be very supportive. And it's very, very important. And we and I, I miss time to, to do that. Okay, and the Liberté Pédagogique you mentioned, how much time does that represent for a teacher? How much uh, in, Liberté Pédagogique do they have? In fact, liberté pédagogique means that uh, in the French curriculum, you have notions. And at the end of the year, pupils have to know that, that you do as you want. OK, OK. It's, it's not a specific period of time that is no, no, no. dedicated it's to doing whatever. Every hour, yeah. you are going to do your own choice. And so when we train teachers, one thing which is very important for us is to make them understand what is a learning brain. So when they do their choice, their pedagogical, pedagogical choice, they can ask themselves, when I do that, what, um, what are doing the brain of my students? Mm. And so it's a way by which they can choose from one strategy to another. OK. OK, thanks. Other questions? So you can either raise your hand or... Uh, switch your uh, camera on. Uh, maybe just a, a question for Leah. So you, you mentioned the Energy Gen program and you said that the Energy Gen program uh, uh, is, is something like an intervention. So you're not just me measuring association or correlation, you're really intervening uh, uh, to change uh, the, the LF's mindset. So can, can you elaborate a, a bit more on this uh, intervention? Yeah, we have three interventions per grade. So we go for grade sixth grade to uh, uh, ninth grade, and we have three interventions for middle school students. We try to change mindset because we know that having a growth mindset, that means thinking that your intelligence can grow, uh, leads to better scholar achievements. And we can change this mindset from fixed to a growth mindset. So we help students to have a growth mindset and we provide them some tools like the whoop to help them because once they think that they can improve, they have to know how they can improve. So we are providing them some tools to do that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Maria, you have a question? No, oh, sorry, you, you, just, you switched your camera on. I thought it was because you had a question to, to, to ask. Okay, thanks. Um, we have time for one or two more questions. Um, it's now or never. 
Yeah, I, I might have one question for Adeline. Yes, um, maybe. Uh, in the same vein as your question. Um, I was just wondering, um, to which extent do you think that uh, in the future, um, the, your uh, way, the way you are working with teachers uh, in your academy is going to spread among other academies? Um, yeah, I was just uh, interested in your feedbacks about maybe the experience you had with um, your colleagues. And uh, because, of course, for us, uh, <laughs> we think that uh, every academy should work this way and have a learning lab and so on. But I don't know, uh, what are the, do you have any objection from your colleagues and what are they, uh, what are they, uh, yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, I think that <clears throat> there is a really big misunderstanding about what is uh, cognitive sciences of learning. And um, sometimes when you say, oh, I use um, uh, cognitive science results to think about what we could do in class, you have a reaction like, wow, no, but human is not science and you can't um, apply uh, scientific results in a classroom because classroom is too far complicated. You have so many uh, different things going on. Um, so, um, we can have those kind of uh, of answer. And three years ago, when I well, four years ago, when I started the project, I invited all my inspectors colleagues to a meeting to present the purpose of the project. And you have to know that we are um, about ninety doing the same job as me. And at the first meeting, we were three. So one year after that, I, I proposed another one meeting and we were two. <laughs> but last year, I just proposed another one and we were 35. So we really had time for me to explain what I was doing, what were the results we were uh, using, the scientific results uh, we were uh, trying to implement in schools. And the reactions were very good, in fact. Um, so I'm very confident. And when I go in schools right now, I can see really a difference between now and four years ago. So during four years, we, we made, um, maybe it was not enough, but we made what we could. And I can see the results in classrooms. So I think that we, we have to go on again and again, and I'm very confident with the fact that um, the more time is going and the more we are going to, to spread uh, some efficient strategies to teach and efficient way to learn for uh, all the pupils. Thank you. But I would say that we, we really need um, researchers to work with us. It's very important when a researcher come, take time to come and talk to trainers, talk to teachers, meet students, come in school to see how it's going on. And um, it's very different when you have a study on scientific papers and when you want to implement it in a school. For example, last year with Frank, I see that Frank is with us, um, we, we worked with a middle school team about uh, behaviors and how to regulate um, some behaviors in school. And it was very interesting to see that you have the scientific results, okay? But when you want to implement a project in a school with all the teachers, all the disciplines, the organization of a middle school, it's not so easy. And we worked with the team to build tools and strategies to see how we can implement uh, this um, very important result in the everyday life of a school. So we tried to do that last year. Okay, thank you, Adeline, for this very comprehensive uh, answer. D'autres um, questions? Any more? Any other questions? 
Um, maybe one last question or one, one question for, for Elena. So we, we hear a lot about metacognition today. Um, and so maybe I'm wrong, but metacognition is, is a, an ability that is maybe more domain general, or maybe less well circumscribed as uh, uh, other cognitive functions such as, such as memory, for example. So what is the, the ultimate goal? Is it to, to use uh, metacognitive abilities or to use metacognitive information or measures such as confidence to improve uh, teaching and learning or to, to directly improve metacognition abilities in, uh, in students? I would say both actually. Joelle is with us, she's more involved. Uh, she's really involved in the Conseil Scientifique de l'Education Nationale on a specific, she has a specific group working on metacognition. And I think the, the, the the work for now is using knowledge about metacognition to enhance learning and to enhance learning, especially for children who are uh, in some difficulties with their school results, uh, which are not necessarily due to lim cognitive limits of uh, understanding of the topics, but other not knowing how to study, not feeling confident in your capacities of understanding, etc. So all the knowledge in the domain of confidence on on the one side, on in the domain of feedback and what's the role of feedback in, in um, calibrating your, your confidence uh, in the right way and uh, all the work on some strategies, practical strategies to become aware of your learning processes, uh, including strategies which are very practical and come from studies on memory, but which become metacognitive interventions in school. Uh, what Adeline was, uh, was describing, for instance, space to learning, the fact of making plans uh, uh, of your learning, etc. These are all advices, implementations that you can, you can make in school, test their efficiency, and they come from the research on metacognition or on other domains, but become metacognitive interventions because they make you aware of how you learn. At the same time, uh, there are programs for younger kids to enhance the development of metacognitive skills, not just with strategies, but also with training to, to exert your metacognition and to assess your confidence, have constant feedback to see how it works and if it generally enhances metacognition beyond the specific strategies that you can implement about memory, etc. So if you, if you have uh, these capacities of using your metacognition spontaneously uh, in different situations. So I would say that it's very, very large and uh, there's not one single approach to metacognition. It's true that it is a little bit trendy uh, at this moment, but I think it, it's, it's just because Lots of research has been done in the last years and we see it all the time. There's a tipping point and it's, I think it's important as a general message. There's a tipping point where fundamental research arrived at a certain level of uh, stability of certain uh, knowledge, which can be transferred into practice. This is not the case for all the domains of research in cognitive science. And we should know that. There are lots of things that are very interesting for us as researchers, for you, but honestly, it's too early. It's too early to, to, to try to implement them in practice. That's too uncertainty. And so it's, it's, not, it's not yet the case. Metacognition has, has reached the tipping point. And so immediately you see a lot of interventions of both the kinds you were, you were describing. And I, I wanted to add a, a word to what Adeline was saying about uh, the difficulties and the challenges of doing, of doing research in, in the domain of education. Uh, because it, I think it's what you're looking for is venues and jobs. And there are different venues that you can, uh, that can pursue in this domain if you are interested in, in, in education. One is becoming a researcher, still a researcher, but an applied researcher. And in that case, you need to know education very deeply. Uh, you cannot think to go from the lab to the class like that because you just won't understand what teachers are saying and they will not understand what you are saying and you will have different goals. So this is very important to have people like Adin, for instance, or Lea, who are bridges. Uh, between two words which are still today separate words. We are trying to bridge them, but we need a second job 
which is not just the researcher, which is this kind of mediator who knows both words. And Adeline represents it very well because she is a teacher with a strong background in cognitive science and in science. And other people that I know that follow our courses at the Cogmaster are, are like that. But this knowledge of these two words or these new professions of people knowing the two words and making bridges, inventing, engineering strategies of education because they know education, they know cognitive science, they can invent new stuff and other people will test them or they will test them in the classroom. So there are several professions that we can imagine in this new world, which is translational research in, uh, in, in education. And it is a little bit up to you to invent some of these jobs uh, by finding uh, projects, uh, creating projects, uh, um, making contact with school, with teachers who are eager to collaborate. And also not forgetting that there are things like participative research where you can not be in the class, but to help teachers Adeline's teachers, for instance, to structure their observation of the classroom, uh, to structure and make pseudo experiments uh, in the classroom to obtain preliminary results that then you can use to build bigger projects, research projects. So it's an exciting domain and it is building right up right now so it's really up to you to 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 try to understand it and, and to feed it with uh, with your 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 ideas and new and new jobs new venues it's not the existing don't look at the past uh imagine what it could be in the future uh, in terms also of jobs thank you elena uh, i think that valeria has a question yeah Hello, everybody. No, I just want to add uh, to what Elena just said. I think that uh, it's important also to, to say that at the institutional level, it would be good to have some changes because it's not only, as we see with Adelina, there are lots, uh, there are more and more teachers that want to be part of this uh, new uh, panorama, let's say. But uh, on the side of um, research, uh, I think that there is not enough has been made to have researchers working uh, specifically on in translational uh, in translational context i think and i i think it's something we can't uh, we can't solve right now but i uh, i don't know i know that now i learned now that uh, lea is doing a phd on these topics and it's very good but i i think that at the institutional level there's still uh, not enough uh, that it's done to find the researchers uh, and, and jobs and to open jobs in research that would be uh, specifically addressed to people who wants to do this kind of, uh, of work. And I, I think that it, this is very, uh, it's a delicate issue because um, then you have uh, to provide people with jobs. <laughs> and so uh, this, this is something that I think, uh, I think that the, the Cog Master and our environment is doing a lot, but I think that that's not common. And this is something that as researcher, we should be aware of and, uh, and uh, open a dialogue, open a, on that. Uh, that. That's the only thing that I wanted to say. So I'm very happy to see that lots of teachers are much, much open that they were uh, before. I had a previous, my previous uh, job was in Nancy when I had lots of contacts with people at the IREM. Uh, and lots of people were against cognitive science, like uh, saying, okay, but, and I think that Elena has lots, <laughs> a lot to tell about that. So it's very good to see that the, there is an opening there, but I think that on the other side, it should be a more, more awareness uh, on the research side as well. Uh, that's the only thing I wanted to say. So I don't know if you want to comment on that. Thank you, Valeria. Uh, maybe one final question. No. Uh, actually, I have a question. Uh, just, just very curious question. If the maybe the Fondation Malapat or maybe the Academy de Versailles or Energigen has a program um, um, that aims to educate like um, students to climate change issues and environmental issues, is there something? specific about that just curious uh 
for La Malapat, yes, there is. It's called, uh, it's a branch of La Malapat, a new branch of La Malapat. It's called Office for Climate Education, OCE. And uh, they're doing exactly that. They're, they, are, they are connected with the IPCC, the Group on Climate Change, uh, intergovernmental, intergovernmental Group on Climate Change. And uh, in, uh, in relationship with them, they produce uh, pedagogical activities for children and training activities for teachers related to the last reports of the IPCC in order to make them understandable and uh, to have students take them into their own hands, let's say, somehow, and understand the science behind. And they're, of course, very interested in collaborating with students of the COG Master in Cognitive Science because there's the double issue of making students understand concepts which are complex uh, and, uh, uh, and to take action which is a completely different, different stuff than understanding. Uh, from understanding doesn't come action. So how do you also uh, enhance action in this domain? So they're interested in the two things and they are uh, juicier. Uh, and if someone of you wants their contact, they can write it immediately in the chat or you write to me, huh? it's, it's, it's not a problem. Okay, uh, it's 12 past 12. Um, I think that we'll stop there. So again, thank you very much to the speakers and for their great uh, presentation. So the, the video of the session will be available in, I think, one or two weeks uh, on the Decaltax webpage, uh, voila. So um, thank you all uh, for your participation and uh, have a nice day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay.